Warwick served during the Second World War in the 8th Army under General Montgomery, and he got a very first-hand look at the contribution that the American nation gave, both in terms of their people who fought and the American presidents and the American government support long before they formally entered the Second World War for the Allies. And he strongly believed that America should be encouraged to remain involved in Europe and have an interest in Europe. And he pondered the question over many years of how do you give a country that at that time appeared to have everything something of value? And his answer was, you give them a piece of their history. And what better piece of their history could you give than the original Mayflower? And of course, the original Mayflower was broken up many years ago. The issue is, could you build a replica? And could that be a symbol of the friendship between the two English-speaking countries? He didn't want to do it himself. He never thought for a second that he would do it. He was a journalist. His passion and love was, after history, the media. And he kept trying to persuade his bosses, the owners of newspapers in Fleet Street, where the newspaper industry was based, to produce the money to build the Mayflower. And he, he would be the one to help publicize it. So he spent many years being politely but firmly told that no money would be forthcoming for this grand scheme. And remember, this grand scheme was in 1952, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Only five or so years after the end of the Second World War. It was a time of great austerity. You know, people were still rebuilding houses, rebuilding the infrastructure of a country that had been, you know, severely damaged. There wasn't money for frivolous activities. And many people looked upon this as a little bit of a frivolous dream. He talked to anyone who would listen in Fleet Street and he was very well connected. And one day he got an introduction to a, a gentleman called Felix Fenston who had made a fortune after the Second World War on property. And he went to see Fenston, made his pitch, which he'd made hundreds of times, and Fenston gave him 500 pounds and he then started to dream up one scheme after another to raise the rest of the money. And the long story short is he raised that money over two years. He had a genuine passion for history and he brought history alive for whoever he was talking to. So he produced a number of newspapers called Mayflower Magazine, which made clear to the reader the importance of, the, of Mayflower in the evolution of democracy in the 1600s and the early beginnings of democracy in America and how important it was. He then had the challenge of going to see someone in the shipbuilding industry with zero knowledge of what he was requesting. So although Brixham and Devon is probably best visited via train, which is very many efficient trains, he decided he had to make a grand impression. So he booked a, a flight to Exeter Airport and had Stuart Upham meet him there. He thought Upham might think he was more wealthy than he actually was. The two men apparently rode in silence pretty much the way down about to Brixham. And then Upham started talking about his experience with wooden ships. And within a minute or so, the two men turned on each other and one was shouting, you've got to build it. And the other says, uh, was saying, 
you know we can build it, we must build it. They basically fell upon each other and Warwick didn't consider going anywhere else from that point onwards. They then started talking about how the ship would be built and Upham went into all sorts of detail about the need for plans and Warwick said, well, he got plans for a model, how would that work? And Upham said, not really, we've got to do better than that. And the next thing was uh, they talked about what equipment they would use, you know, the tools they would use to build the ship. And Warwick said, well, it must be historically accurate. To which Upham said, well, what do you mean? Well, we've got to use the tools they used in the 17th century. So Upham said, well, I'm not sure we've got many people who would know how to use all of those tools. So Warwick said, well, you've got to find somebody to train your people. To which Upham said, well, that's going to put the cost up a little bit. And Warwick said, I don't care. That's the way it's got to be. It's got to be historically accurate as possible. The first ship went by the northern route, which was way more dangerous because, you know, going into a winter in particular, there was more likely to be bad weather, violent storms and, you know, and, and, and the risk of sheep shipwreck. The captain, Warwick wanted to go the northern route, but Captain Villiers told Warwick about three days when they were out to sea, he was going to take the long south route, go down off the coast of Spain and then across and then up the coast, which where the weather is uh, that time of the year was going to be dramatically better. So it was safer. And, you know, his logic was, uh, Villiers said, look, we're setting out on a ship that we're not really familiar with. They'd had something like a few days, not even weeks, of sea trials pottering around Brixham Harbour and, and then Plymouth. So the ship hadn't been properly tested and Villiers knew there were going to be some problems with, you know, some of the features of the ship. So th they went the southern route rather than the shorter, more dangerous route. Now, he was forever trying to calculate when they would arrive as well, because he'd promised the people in America the ship would arrive somewhere around May the 26th. Now, the experienced sailors on board tried desperately to tell him you couldn't predict with a sailing ship because you couldn't predict the winds. And they kept saying, look, the sea and the winds are a fickle mistress. But that didn't stop Warwick sort of appearing at all times of the day and night and trying to calculate when they would arrive. It turned out to be almost more significant than Warwick had expected it to be. The Mayflower actually helped to rebuild Anglo-American relationships very quickly. First of all, the Prime Minister of Britain resigned and Anthony Eden became the new Prime Minister. Eisenhower was re-elected by a landslide. And there was a period of wondering how to repair Anglo-American relations. So the word that there was a ship called the Mayflower II about to be built and sailed over was seized upon by many people in the media as well as politicians, not just in America, but all around the world, as a possibility of helping to restore the normal strong bond between the two Anglo-speaking countries. 